17 and all your dreams are knocking on your front door none of this go-getter attitude maybe that's not for me 25 you realize that nothing is the same as before i am expected to give but it's not reciprocated from anyone where did we go where did we go where did we go all of those years i don't trust myself still how did we end up how did we end up how did we end up here i still think till this day i was the problem because i've been told that my whole life is it all Hello, beautiful people. I'm Rachel Sievers, and you're listening to Consent to Treat. Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to Consent to Treat. I'm Rachel Sievers, life coach, counselor, and my favorite flower is the peony. Cut flower, not growing flower. But if I was going to get like a bouquet of flowers, I would want it to be the peony. Today, we are listening to a real-life counseling session between me and someone we've never heard from before. Her name is Ezzy. She's a 25-year-old accountant, Hispanic lesbian, who moved from her family home just five months ago. She's what I would call a novice mental health guru. She came to me already knowing her issues, and she was right. Codependency, people-pleasing, and trauma. Ezzy has experienced severe chronic trauma at the hands of her mother and, by proxy, the hands of her brothers. I even define some of the abuse as torture. What's important to remember as you listen to this session is how recent the torture occurred. She only left the situation five months ago. What is also important to note is the situation is not a three-month or two-year abusive relationship. The situation is her childhood. She only left her torturous childhood five months ago. Ezzy found me on TikTok. She approached me to help her through her childhood trauma. For the sake of her privacy, we are keeping Ezzy's real name and identifying information hidden. She has given us permission to record and publish this session. Please be aware sessions with me always include mature language. And today we also offer a trigger warning as today's session details verbal and emotional violence and torture. All right. And with that, hate it. Love it, learn something. Enjoy. So we've never worked together. This is our first time yeah. seeing each other as I'm can I be honest with you? Huh. I never would have imagined because I knew you because of TikTok and mm-hmm. now being part of this journey that you have going on for yourself is like, whoa, how does that even happen? You know, how does it happen? Do you feel like it's, well, for me, it feels like God stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, like bringing people together at just the right time. Yeah. For whatever reason, we we don't know. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Or do you feel like it's just all just a coincidence? And no, I I honestly think, like you said, like God, the universe Mm -hmm. puts people in your life that you need at the moment. And I feel like you came at the right moment for me, for sure. Mm. So I'm grateful for that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm like excited but nervous at the same time, Uh huh. you know, because I feel like because we've talked like we've had conversations, me and you, you know, I've opened yeah. up to you. But I feel like this is actually me opening up like, oh, what is Rachel going to think? <laughs> I'm just thinking I'm a mess. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now, why don't we start with today? OK. Like, where are you at today? Physically? How are you feeling emotionally? What's on your mind today? I think physically I feel not so good. But, well, actually, no, I feel a little bit better now. I feel better. Mentally. (laughs) Why do you feel better? (laughs) (laughs) I just got done throwing up. (laughs) (laughs) A little too much tequila. (laughs) I did. Okay. Um, Mentally, I feel like I'm in a place right now where I finally can sit with my emotions and like know what I'm feeling at the moment. So like right now I feel like at peace, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. but within that peace, like I still feel a lot of sadness over my mom. Like okay. I'm trying to like not show it, you know, especially with my friends being around and or like at work, you know? Yeah. But my mom this has been taking a big toll. The whole main topic right now has just been my mom. 
Mm-hmm. My mom has been the reason why I feel like my emotions have been all over the place. And then Mother's Day just passed too. Okay, yeah. And I didn't reach out to her. And yeah, my family didn't take that very well. And that's been like really hurting my feelings for sure, you know? What did they expect of you? So you you moved out of your parents' yeah. home mm-hmm. five months ago now? Yeah. Yeah. Five months ago. Yeah. And it seemed like they were kind of coming to terms with it because they didn't like it at first, right? Yeah. No, they didn't like it at all. <laughs> like they you were... should not be leaving yeah. our home. Yeah. I mean, we stopped talking, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And then they opened that door of, well, tell us what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. And once I did, it seemed like they were understanding. But I think when it comes to my family, I know them so well that I knew it was coming from a genuine place when they were like, we're here for you. We understand you. But I also knew like their mama's voice, you know, they're always going to take your brother's side. Yeah. So I knew in between like, yeah, I'm there for you. Yeah, we understand you. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Mm-hmm. I knew that. They also, in the back of their heads, they, regardless, are, we're going to take mom's side, you know? You're the youngest, right? I'm the youngest. Yeah. How old are your brothers? My brothers are 20 years apart from me. So like they're late 40s. Okay. So much older. So much older. Okay. Yeah. You're the baby baby. And I'm the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm a woman too. So mm-hmm. it's Mexican households. They're, they're rough. Right. You know? Why would you, why would you leave? You're just a woman. Like what? Why would yeah. you leave the home? Yeah. Without what a man? <laughs> <laughs> You're an adult. What? You can't do that. <laughs> right. Why would you do that? But my mom, I started noticing a pattern since I was little that she depended a lot on me. Mm-hmm. You know, it I was like nine, eight, and I could tell that the relationship that I had with my mom was very different to the relationship she had with my brothers. And It was like, you're supposed to help me. I brought you here for a reason. You wouldn't be here if I never had brought you here, you know? I didn't have sex with your dad. You wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know, like blaming me for everything. For existing. And I mean, my dad too, like he's non-existent in my life because I choose to not have a relationship with him either. Uh So I'm like messed up, you know? (laughs) I like no mom, no dad, you know, but... She would definitely blame me a lot, like for that relationship that happened between my dad and her, you know, you know, what do you mean? She would blame you for what? For that relationship. She would basically tell me like, basically, like if I had her, like I gave birth to her, you know, like, like you and your dad, like you guys fucked up my life, you know, you guys, sorry about my language, but. Oh, no, it's fine. Like she would blame me for a lot of the whole situation. And I knew my mom had like a really rough past because she did, Mm -hmm. you know, but I think she projected that a lot onto me and she did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But when I came out to her, I was, I want to say 14, 13, 14, you know, it was around that age. Mm -hmm. I had came out to her at first. I just came out as bi because I was like, if I throw in there that I'm actually a lesbian, it's not going to go like Mm -hmm. good at all for me Mm -hmm. and either way like me coming out as bi like neither my brothers took it well you know no one in my family took it well Mm -hmm. but my mom specifically and I realized that once I had because our relationship was already bad but I realized once I had came out to her it just got worse and there's a specific trauma that I have with her where legit like the next day that I had came out like she like woke me up you know screaming She's like, get get ready, get fucking ready. And I was like, for what? She's like, I'm taking you to the fucking salon and we're cutting your hair since you want to be a boy. I was like, that's, wow. yeah, I was like, that's not it. Like, that's actually not what liking women is, you know? Yeah. There's so many terms for other, you know, that would be like transgender, you know? I'm not coming out as transgender. <laughs> right. Um, But I remember that and... Yeah, it was just bad. Like, our relationship was just so bad. Mm. And she wouldn't admit it. Like, she would just say that it was because of me. Like, she treated me like that because I deserved it, you know? Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm going to start crying. Just um, pause. Just pause with it. Take your time. Sorry. 
You don't have to apologize. That's my thing, too. I apologize a lot. Yeah. My mom left me with some trauma, man. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> if you check in with your body right now, are you feeling anything physically, like chest, tummy, face, neck, any tightness, my heaviness? Throat, like, it's in your throat? It's like like crying. I feel it like on my throat, my yeah. eyes. Like my, I can feel the crying is coming. <laughs> yeah. I want us to just always be like really gentle with that part. You know, mm-hmm. if it's there, just give it some time. Whether you cry or not, it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. But just to like recognize it and let it be okay that it's there. We don't want to push it down or try to ignore it. Yeah. Or I think I do do that a lot. But I think I learned that since I said like since I was young mm-hmm. to not feel. I think I started pushing down my emotions like around like 14, 15. Because I would tell myself, I'm not going to let my mom see me cry. She can do whatever she wants to me, but I cannot let us, like, I cannot show her. I can't show her that I'm crying, you know, can't. Wow. That's so heavy. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's like, I don't want to give her the gift of that or the satisfaction of that, which implies that Mm -hmm. my mom wants to see me crying. Yeah. It was toxic. It was a very unsafe environment for me yeah and I think that's minimizing it really (laughs) like that that to say the least sorry to know take your time this is the mother the mother you know the person who is supposed to be the safe person the safest connection the protector yeah the nurturer the one who's who's growing us we're supposed to be the little seed and she's watering us and giving us sunshine and yeah tilling the soil and creating a beautiful atmosphere for us to grow yeah. into our fullest potential and but she's just like the opposite yeah but she was good at at manipulating that though like in my head she would make it seem like what she was doing, it was what a mother should be doing, you know? She would always say that. Do you feel like you were mind-fucked at some point where you actually believed her? Yeah. Yeah. Because at one point, like, I would defend her. Like, everyone would, not obviously my family, you know, they die hard for my mom, but, like, people around me, like my friends and Mm -hmm. adults, they would tell me, like, this is not okay. And, like, I would just, go ham like I would defend my mom I'd be like no 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 like she's just doing her job she's being a mom you know Mm. but then I realized like when time just kept passing and it was just like an everyday thing I don't think there was ever a day where I felt peace Mm -hmm. you know like Mm -hmm. I felt like something's not gonna happen you know I feel like every single day of my life there was just chaos with my mom and that's how I left my life yeah. And not only that, but she like sheltered me a lot. Like I feel like right now I'm barely discovering myself because I couldn't be myself around her. Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't speak. Not not only just to her though, like to my brothers too. I really couldn't be myself around my family. You know, the majority of the time I was with my family. So I was masking basically who I was actually. Mm-hmm. At one point, like, it just became, I just became someone I didn't know, you know, mm-hmm. someone that was just surviving. Because at this very moment, I feel like I'm barely discovering who I am, what I like, what's actually right, what's actually wrong. For you. Yeah. For you, yeah. But yeah, it's, it was rough. And when Mother's Day was happening, I was just thinking, like, I really want to text her. You know, because regardless of everything, like, I still have so much love for her. You know, I have so much care for her. But I was thinking, how can I tell someone on Mother's Day, like, oh, you're the best mom. I love you. You know, even if it's just a text. Yeah. You know, you're the best mom. I love you. It felt, like, disingenuous. Yeah, it's like, that's not true. You know, that's actually not true. And then my brother's, like, gaslighting me, like, why wouldn't you? Now mom feels really bad. Mom actually had the worst Mother's Day, you know? Mm-hmm. And at one point, my people pleasing, uh, it's just, I was like, oh, man, I did that. I made my mom feel bad. But that's how I know she still has a lot of control over me mm-hmm. because she's so far away from me and I still think about her. 
Like, how is this making her feel? How does this make her feel? Mm-hmm. You know, even getting my tattoos, because I've been going crazy on my tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> I still think like, wow, my mom's going to, when she sees me like this, she's going to go crazy, wow. you know, yeah. instead of like not caring. Right. But she like dictates a lot still of my life. And I don't want her to have that power, you know, but I don't know how to not feel like I still have a lot of healing because. Yeah. Do you feel like her power over you has diminished since you've moved out? Of course. There's been a lot that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this relationship with my mom, it was like rough because it was every single day. But once I got into my relationship, my long-term relationship that I was in, Mm -hmm. it, it, I realized it got worse, you know, because she realized like, wow, this is actually a person that my daughter could potentially marry or move in with. And now I'm going to lose her. So I feel like it just got worse. Her behavior is like intensified. It intensified like 10 times more. Wow. It was like, now that I think about it, I'm like, wow. Like, I don't know how my mom could tell me, I love you, Miha. And then still do the things that she would do. Mm -hmm. And the things that she would say to me, like they were bad, like so bad. I couldn't even go out with friends because she would, when I come, would have come back, she would tell me like, oh, are you done being a whore? Like, were you done? You know, like, Mm. but in Spanish, it just, it sounds worse, you know, Mm -hmm. because I don't know why everything in Spanish (laughs) when it comes to like (laughs) getting cussed at and stuff, it just sounds (laughs) even worse. But yeah, like with my mom, I definitely suffered, you know, mental abuse and physical abuse because that's how she would show supposedly her love towards me. What a mind fuck. Yeah, and And it got to the point where, like I said, once I was in this relationship, it was every single day. It would affect me everywhere. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even go to work. Sometimes she would even send my brothers to my job just to make sure that I was working. What? Yeah. She thought you just weren't going to work or something? Yeah. What? I was 22, 23, even till now, because I barely moved out, you know, like every aspect of my life she was controlling. Wow. Like everything and that's that's where I'm trying to head out like I realized I was legit in survival mode because every time I would wake up and I had plans I was scared to tell her because it wasn't like oh mom I'll be back you know I'm gonna go hang out with my friends or I'm gonna go to work or I'm gonna do this it was no you have to ask me for permission Mm -hmm. and I knew that once I started asking for permission quote unquote it was gonna turn into a really bad argument and it 100% it would always be a bad argument you know mm. and I would just be anxious all the time you know I at one point I would just start parking at parks or trying to pass time instead of going home instead of going home because I just didn't want to go home yeah you know yeah and even then like even when I did get home it was just all over again you yeah. know why are you getting home at this time and then I think what made my mom act out more is because I realized that she was good at manipulating me. Like she hated that I wouldn't talk back to her. Mm. And she would be like. She couldn't get you to engage. Yeah. Like I said, I would suppress my emotions. Obviously, everything she was telling me. And like sometimes when she would lay hands on me, of course, you know, I was hurting inside. But I wouldn't show it. So she would continue to yell at me and throw things and do these things. And at one point, like she would always say, why are you not talking back to me? Why are you not answering me? Why are you not? And then when I would, it was like even more explosive. It was like, why are you talking back to me? Yeah. You know, the manipulation. Like, why are you talking back to me? Why are you, right. you know, why are you so disrespectful? See, this is why you're such a bad daughter. So she would flip it to where she would make me feel like it was me. It was like, your fault. I right. made her react like that. Yeah. It got to the point where she would even tell me like, I'm going to call the cops on you. Because I don't want you here. I don't want you in this household anymore. And in my head, like, it would be a mind fuck because then I would be like, I have to leave then, you know? Mm-hmm. And then when I would try to leave, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. She would hold me back, you know? She said, like, you're not going anywhere. Even so though. So I don't want you here. Yeah. I'm going to call the cops. But you can't go. Yeah. I imagine, like, if you get into conversation with friends or you meet a new person and you are like, yeah, you know, the relationship with my mom is really bad. Like, 
do you have the sensation of like, where do I even begin? Like you wouldn't even believe. It's like, it's like a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's of a how mom I feel. who's like trapping her daughter and torturing her. Yeah. But the thing is, she did all of this, but she was good at like making me believe it was because of me. Like it was my fault. Right. You know, and I believed it a hundred percent. Like, damn, I should be a better daughter. She's right. I shouldn't be doing this. Just always, 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 always looking up after her. Even though she said I wasn't, that I never cared about her and that I was a bad daughter. It was never enough. It was never enough. Yeah. But now that I'm out of it, I could see like why I feel like it's actually not okay. You know, <laughs> right. everything that she's doing. <laughs> right. Everything was just so bad, like bad, bad, bad every single day. And there was a specific conversation I had with one of my good friends. I had told her, I was like, like, I feel like I'm trapped. I feel like I can never have enjoyed my time with any of you or at the time with my ex-girlfriend, you know, because mm-hmm. I was always on edge. Like yeah. my mom's calling, my mom's texting me. When I get home, I already know it's going to be bad. I already know. It got to the point where like she would even prevent me from going to work. Like I couldn't even go to work. Because that's how bad it it got. Wow. I don't know how I survived that long, honestly. Because I, like I said, I was voicing that to my friend. I was like, I just can't enjoy my time. I feel like I'm always on edge. I'm not present. And I'm not going to lie. I think that's, I envy that out of everyone. That you guys don't get to experience how I feel. You know, like Mm -hmm. I envy that you guys are actually enjoying your time. You guys don't know what it's like to just be on edge all the time and having to go home and experience that because these arguments would go for hours, hours. It got to the point too where she started doing it even in public and Mm -hmm. I would be so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But the abuse would go for hours, like hours. And I would just find any excuse to leave the house. I'd be like, I'll be back. I'll be this. And then I started feeling guilty because she would tell me like, you don't spend time with me anymore you don't hang out with me. You don't like hanging out with me. And then I would have my brothers telling me too, like, well, you're a bad person because you don't hang out with mom, Mm -hmm. you know? And I would tell myself, but why would I want to hang out with someone that just does damage to me all the time? Right. You know, but the people pleasing, I was like, damn, maybe they're right. Maybe I am being a bad daughter. Right. I should want to spend time with my mom. Right. She's my mom. Yeah. I would sometimes go to work like with an hour of sleep because sometimes she would wake me up. Like she would legit like throw pillows at me or she like slap me and start arguing with me. And she's like, you're not fucking sleeping until we have this conversation. Your dad was in the home, right? No, my dad's like non-existent. Oh, okay. So Mm -hmm. you're all alone in the home with this person. My brother, we lived with my older brother. And he's not intervening. He's not speaking up. He's not protecting you. He's not, he's not recognizing this as abusive. No, because like I mentioned Mm -hmm. to them, I was the problem. Mom's acting like this because you're the problem. How She has every right to do this. How have you gotten to this place where you see it for what it is? You're starting to heal. Like what, what are you doing for yourself to grow beyond this domestic violence? When you say domestic violence like that, it, it like breaks my heart. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. <laughs> I was going to do it again. Let's <laughs> pause with that. Usually when we say we have a broken heart, we actually feel our heart breaking like physically, right? Yeah. Do you feel it? I do. Yeah. So let's be really compassionate with that and just give that broken heart some space. When you breathe into it, like allow that air to just cover it, hold it, be sweet to it, you know? I think if I wouldn't have met my ex-girlfriend, I feel like I would have probably never had realized though, if I'm being honest, because she's the one, the first one to have called it out like hey your mom your mom's a little too overprotective you know Mm -hmm. why is she calling you 10 times or why are you not answering the phone because that was my main thing every time I was with her she would call me like 20 times and I did not want to answer 
because at the time I wasn't very vocal to her of all of this that was going on because mm-hmm. I felt like people wouldn't know how to take that and they would just leave and I didn't want to lose people mm. so I would just keep it in I wouldn't Gosh. you know I wouldn't You're voice so isolated in all of this yeah and so she knew she had a glimpse you know she knew yeah but I never told her like oh yeah it happens every day or I don't get sleep because me and my mom are just up arguing all the time Mm -hmm. or she's laying hands on me you know but it did take myself though to want to leave because I and that's where I said like people come into your life for a reason because I feel like you came at the perfect time Mm -hmm. because it was just at the time that I had met you like it was just really it just got bad Mm -hmm. like even though everything that I said was bad it was just worse Mm -hmm. like so I started recording her mm-hmm. and I was listening. Well, first of all, when I was scrolling through my, my recordings, there's so many, there's so many. Really? It broke my heart. You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. It goes up to like two years. Wow. And then when I listened to one of them, it is like bad. Like, um, like I said, like she said something like, well, I treat you like this because you're shit you deserve shit and that like when I was hearing that like a month ago like I just I was like wow I can't believe I like took all of this abuse you know and so when my relationship ended I don't know for what reason but my mom just got worse now she wasn't just attacking because she would attack my ex-girlfriend all the time she would bring her up all the time she's not a good person she's this she's that and then once that relationship ended she didn't have someone to talk about so I realized she started aiming for whatever she could aim for mm-hmm. my friends mm-hmm. my coworkers, mm-hmm. and then I realized oh you're just like this like you just don't want me to have anyone in my life that's crazy she would tell me you think your friends are your friends they're not your friends oh you think your coworkers care about you they don't care about you I only care about you, even though she's putting me through all this abuse. Yeah. And that's when I knew I have to talk about this with someone. Mm -hmm. I need to tell someone I need help because I was like really heartbroken, like super heartbroken when my relationship ended. And when you're heartbroken, like the healthy thing is your friends, especially your mom, they're there for you. They hold you. Ideally, yeah. When you're crying, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Brand new ice cream. Opposite. Like, I I still have it in my head of what I told myself. As she was, like, looking me in the eyes, I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to leave. I have to save myself. I know this is going to sound bad, but I was like, I don't think I'm going to make it to 26 if I continue to stay here. Mm -hmm. I was crying to my nephews. Once she saw that I was crying and they had walked out of the room, she came into my room. She started arguing with me. And then she, like, comes to my face starts like pulling on my hair and then she's like straight in my face why are you such a dumbass what the fuck is wrong with you like why are you crying you know like invalidating all of my feelings wow and just making it about her and i'm getting abused (laughs) Uh but at the same time i'm getting like physically like getting yelled at i'm not physically but like mentally getting yelled at like bad right and when i was looking at her in the eyes I felt this is not my mom. I've never had a mom. I don't know who you are. Mm. But when she did that, she saw that I was crying. And her first in, like initial thought was, I'm going to go beat her up. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go tell her off. You know, not like, why are you crying, Mija? What's right. wrong with you? Right. Nothing. It just got so bad. And then after that, like, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. And... And that's when, like, I started looking for places. And I was like, okay, I have to, like, I have to leave. I have mm-hmm. to get out of here. Now I'm getting kind of anxious. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. Let's hang out with it for a second. Where are you feeling it? My chest. And then my legs. I can feel them shaking. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. So left to right. Some gentle swaying. Full exhales. Look around the room a little bit. Okay. Pretty good. But yeah, it was, it was very abusive. 
piece of relationship. What, what do you want now, like from counseling or from self work that you're doing? Like, what's most important for you today? I think I just want to heal that part of me. I allow a lot of things to happen in my life because I've allowed my mom to treat me how she treated me. And even with therapy, like, I still think till this day, I was the problem. Right. Because I've been told that my whole life. Mm-hmm. That became my identity. The problem. Yeah. I can't do one little mistake because I instantly, like, think the worst of me. Mm-hmm. Damn, you're such a problem. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to learn how to accept it now. But even criticism, like, I couldn't accept it because I'd be thinking, like, wow, they're criticizing me because they think the worst of me. Mm. They think I'm a bad person. And, like, I'm just constantly changing. But I've realized I'm constantly changing, but for others. Right. To make others feel comfortable around me. And I definitely, what I want out of all of this is to break that generational trauma that's going on in the household. Do you feel like the work that you've done with your therapist has helped you grow? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Have you worked on reparenting techniques, anything like that? Mm -mm. No. No. It's more like talking right now, like more Mm -hmm. tell me what's coming up, telling me. I guess it's because like I don't know how to ask what should I do? Where do I go? What's the next step? You know? Yeah. So what you're wanting to heal is huge. Yeah. It's not going to be as simple as, well, I really want to work on being like more secure in who I am. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> like she fucked me up in that way. And so I yeah. want to work on that. I mean, when you have had a lifetime of violence from your caregiver, it's going to affect everything. Yeah. It's going to affect your nervous system. It's going to affect your thought patterns, your behavior patterns, your relationships. I mean, it's everything. So what you're wanting to heal is like everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm doing all of that. <laughs> yeah. <think>. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I, you're the fact that you only moved away from that situation five months ago, but you are able to sit here and talk about it and have so much self-awareness and to have grown so much in such a short period of time, whatever you're doing, it's working. Like keep doing it. Yeah. If you want to take it to the next level, I would recommend reparenting techniques. Okay. That from my own experience and from the experience with working with my clients, that seems to be what has the the biggest impact Mm -hmm. and the best and fastest growth from healing from parental abuse. Yeah. I'm just, I'm still processing that you like didn't, you called it for what it was, domestic violence. Uh Uh-huh. Because that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. I'm still trying to process that. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, in my head and from what my family has told me and my mom has told me is like, well, we did it out of love. You know, that's fucking bullshit. That's not love. I'm barely learning that. Love doesn't hurt. (sighs) Everything about my life. It's just like this big mind fuck right now. Because I'm finally experiencing like healthy friendships, you know, Yeah. discovering myself. True love. Yeah. And real love. It's like, whoa. Love is I, I see you, I hear you, and you're okay. Yeah. It's How, crazy. However you are today, you're good. That's love. Yeah. The idea behind reparenting is anytime you're recalling these moments with her, these abusive moments with her, imagine your little self mm-hmm. being treated the way that your mom treated your little self. And what you do is you step in as your little self's new parent Oh, and you treat your little self the way she should have been treated. And you speak to her the way she should have been spoken to. That's kind of heavy. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> uh-huh. It's, it's really, really intense work, yeah. but it's so powerful. Yeah. I really do feel for my little me. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine, like, if you have just the image of little you at, like, four or five, can you imagine taking her by the hair, two hands, taking her by the hair and getting in her face and saying, what the fuck is wrong with you? You are a dumbass. Why are you crying? Imagine doing that to you, little you. I can't. Absolutely not. Mm -mm. Literally, that's torturing a child. 
Yeah. I mean, I have, I have nephews, you know? Yeah. I, can well, you imagine doing that to them? I can't imagine. Just grabbing them by the sides of the head. What the fuck is wrong with you? No. So when you step in as that little girl's parent and you see her on her bed crying, what do you do? You want to hold her. Just hold her. You know. I see you. I see that you're in pain. I'm going to be here with you. You're okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? No? Okay. You want to come back and talk about it? Later? Yeah. You know? What do you want? You want some water? Yeah. <laughs> Take your time. Have a cry. I mean, like this, this is how you, you should have been spoken to. This is how you should have been treated. Yeah. And when your mother treated you the way she did, even in adulthood, she was treating that little girl that way. Yeah. That little part of you. That's like, I need my mommy. I need my mommy right now. She's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. But definitely going to start doing that. I feel like I do do that in a way, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think I have been doing that, but like for my nephews. Right. And I think that's why I said it has to stop with me. Yes. You know, I Okay. I'm going to give you a visual. Ready? Mm -hmm. I want you to just try to go with it. Okay. Do I close my eyes? Whatever you want. Whatever you're comfy with. I want you to imagine that you are driving down the PCH. You know what that is? The highway that goes along the, yeah. the ocean? Yeah. Okay. Driving down the PCH. And sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. The ocean's on your right-hand side. Hills are on your left-hand side. And you come to a pullout. So okay. you, pu- you pull your car over to the side of the road and you get out. Mm-hmm. And there's a trail that goes down the hill to the beach. I want you to walk down that trail to the beach. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of soaking it in, just enjoying yourself, right? And you look up the beach and you see that there's a little person. Mm-hmm. So you start walking towards her. And she's like playing in the sand and whatever. And then you notice that it's four-year-old you. What is she doing here? And you don't have to say it out loud, but talk to her. You know, ask her what she's doing here. Hang out with her for a little bit. Give her some love. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> okay. And then ask her if she wants to go home with you. What does she say? She's a little hesitant, but yes. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And if she's hesitant, be gentle with her. You know, like you don't want to be like snatched. (laughs) You're going home with me. You know, like really allow her to process it and just like wait till she's okay with it. And when she is okay with it, take her hand and walk her, walk her back down that beach. Just you and her. Me and her. But before you get to the trail, your mom approaches you. Anxiety. That's what I feel. (laughs) But you are that little girl's fucking protector. You're her mom now, just like you are with your nephews. Like you'll do anything for her. So even if you're anxious, you walk straight up to your mom and you tell her she's mine now. She's not yours. I'm going to take it from here. You do not get her anymore. And you take that little girl up that trail and you put her in the car and you get her seatbelt on her. Let's go. We can eat ice cream. (laughs) Yep. And you fucking pull away. Who fucking cares what your mom has to say? Boom, bitch. I'm out of here. She's mine now. Take her back. And then here's your homework. Should you choose to do it? Give me homework. I will do it. I'm sure you will. (laughs) You look in the rear view mirror and you say, baby, what do you need? What do you need? And your homework is to write down what, what she needs from you. I'm going to do that. It's very emotional. It is. I it started is crying. It's very emotional. Yeah. It's so powerful though, because the thing is, is we need that love, that protection. We need our caregivers to, to give us that. We need our caregivers to see us, to grow us, to be that for us, all those things. And if they don't do it for us, nobody else can do it for us except for ourselves. Ourselves. Mm-hmm. So when you do reparenting, you are really putting all of the healing into your hands. Like I'm taking it from here. I'm going to heal that little girl. It's me. 
our girlfriends can't do it for us. Our friends can't do it for us. Our bosses can't do it. You know, it will try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will certainly try to get them to do it for us, but they can't. They won't. But it's just not possible. It has to come from us. And that's why this is so intense and it's so powerful and it works if you do it. So now going through your days, you just have that little girl with you all the time. Take her to work. When you're cooking your salsa, like this is how you make salsa, like talk to her, have her in the car with you, have her hanging out with your friends with you. Just, you know, you're, you're going to grow her now. Yeah. Like this is how you do life, babe. I'm going to show you. That's actually really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So try it out. Uh, Do, do that homework. It'll probably be intense. It's going to be emotional. (laughs) I'm already an emotional person. (laughs) That's okay. And then our next session, we could talk about how that goes for you and talk about your experiences that you've had with that little girl. And then we can also talk about maybe some other techniques that you can use. Yeah, that would be so helpful. Like if you're going through something, like how do you use reparenting to like go through something in everyday life? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, how do you be sad and use reparenting to work through sadness? So we can add some more techniques in there for you. Yeah to help you heal from the domestic violence. <gasps> I'm, dang, I'm going to have to sit with that there today. There it was again. That was kind of mean, huh, Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you have to say it again? No, it's okay. <laughs> I promise. No, it's just, I really have to sit with that. Yeah. Because that's really what it is. If I want to help little me, yeah, I have to accept that and also take that with me so I'm not continuously getting manipulated by my family Mm, yeah I'm working on feeling like what I did wasn't selfishness like I don't want to feel selfish you know no (laughs) it's not selfish (laughs) no thank you for that Mm -hmm. thank you for sharing this (laughs) it's going to be a blessing for a lot of people to hear this yeah because Think of how quietly you were going through this for so many years. Like think of how many people are out there quietly going through what you're going through and to see you so bravely step out of that on your own, like all Mm -hmm. on your own, like I'm going to do this thing. (laughs) And it was so terrifying for you and it continues to be terrifying and you continue to do it. Like you continue to stand up for yourself and continue to do the right thing for yourself. Like you're doing the hard work right now. And I just... I think that's going to be very inspirational. You know, I hope other people can see what you're doing and if it's safe for them to follow your steps. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> is this an okay place to stop for today? Of course. Yeah, yeah it is. Okay. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? And where have I been? Who am I now? Who am I now? Who am I now? And who was I then? And is it all, oh, all a lie? And is it all, oh, all a lie? Ezzy, gosh. This is the first time we've heard from Ezzy. She pulls on my heartstrings similarly to Mallory from season one. It's like you can hear it in her quivering little voice, what she's been through. You can hear it in the way she talks. But the words she's using are that of a survivor. She can talk about what happened so plainly. My mom came to me. She grabbed the sides of my head. She was shaking me by my hair. And she was saying these words to me, being able to speak about it so plainly, like as if it's a trip to the grocery store, a trip to the amusement park. But the way she's talking about it, kind of this soft, quivering voice, it's like you can hear this is a very abused person with all these mechanisms that have kicked in to make it so that you can just talk about it like as if it's nothing. And that's what it's like talking to Mallory. Gosh. I can relate to Ezzy because when I see old childhood photos, I feel fear. I don't look back and reminisce on childhood with family at all. There's nothing about that that I'm like, oh, boy, that was a really nice time. No, 
it's all fear, 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 fear. I can feel it in my body when I think about my childhood. She mentions in her session that she's never felt a day of peace. And boy, can I relate to that. There was never one day of peace in my life, probably until in my 30s. Peace was not something I'd ever experienced and definitely not in childhood. When you're in a home with someone who's attacking you constantly and purposefully, I think of it like the sniper with that little red dot on your forehead. That was my childhood. The dot was on my forehead and I was going to get shot at any second. Even when you're in your room and the door is closed, you know that your attacker is out there. They're going to get you for something. You don't know what it is, but they're going to get you. It might be like storming in your bedroom. Why did you leave the light on in the bathroom? Or why didn't you rinse the plates before you put them in the dishwasher? Or why aren't you asleep already? I mean, they're lasered in on you, ready to attack you at any time. That was my childhood. One of my parents was, one of them was ignoring me. And one of them was like, there was a laser on me constantly, at least three times a day. (laughs) I got shot emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, sometimes physically. Boom. Gotcha. Gotcha again. So peace was just not part of my world. So I get that. I get that. Yeah. So let's talk about what's clinically significant about Ezzy. And you hear it in her session clearly. And even outside of session, Ezzy's like, oh, I'm sorry. I put my jacket there. I'm sorry. My purse is here. I'm sorry. I came one minute late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ezzy's apologizing. So females tend to apologize more than males. Females are taught to not disturb anyone around them, really, right? So not that males don't apologize needlessly, but females tend to do it more so, right? And it it comes from this place of you don't deserve a place in the world. You don't deserve to take up any space. You don't deserve to take up sound space. You don't deserve to take up physical space. Like, Don't disturb anyone around you. There's a difference between apologizing because you have actually either willfully or accidentally hurt another person, disturbed another person, put another person out. You know, everyone's waiting for you. And you forgot and you show up an hour late and you put everybody out. And yeah, that I'm sorry, guys. I'm really sorry because I I accidentally disturbed all of you. I've been walking down the street sometimes and someone is like, I'm sorry when they pass me. (laughs) And it's a female. She just kind of looks up and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, and kind of moves, moves further away from me, like as if she's just taking up too much space on the fucking sidewalk. So this idea of you're taking up too much space, you're disturbing people around you just by existing. Your existence is disturbing. Let's apply that to Ezzy now. Ezzy apologizes before she cries. Ezzy apologizes before she even needs to pause to take a breath because she's having an emotion. But if you look at where Ezzy comes from, she was taught your mere existence is wrong. Just you existing in my life has caused me so much pain. When your own mother is sending you this message through her words, through her behaviors, of course you're going to become an adult who thinks that just by breathing, just by having an emotion, just by maybe potentially having an emotion, I'm disturbing you. I'm taking up too much space in this whole situation. She puts her purse down and maybe I need to move it over a little bit so I can put my purse down. Oh, I'm sorry. My purse has taken up too much space on this chair. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's such an indication of how much space she believes she deserves to get to take up in this world. If you want to hear me go deeper into the topic of apologizing, subscribe on patreon.com slash Rachel Seavers and listen to Going Deeper Apologizing. You can find the link in the show notes. Something else that's very clinically significant about Ezzy is 
when we talk about her experience with her therapist, and just to let you know, Ezzy has a psychotherapist. She's reached out to me to do some trauma counseling after she found me on TikTok. So I'm doing childhood trauma counseling with her. And then she's working on other things with her therapist. Some people might have this where they have more than one mental health clinician. Just to clarify for listeners, that's okay to do. My job as a clinician in that scenario is to make sure I'm not stepping on any toes. Like any of the work that she's doing with her therapist, I don't want to get in the way of that. And her therapist wouldn't want to get in the way of the counseling that I'm doing with her. So it is okay to have more than one mental health clinician working on different things in different ways. And that's what we're doing with Ezzy. So during the session, I asked Ezzy if her and her therapist were working on reparenting or if her therapist had ever suggested reparenting to her. Ezzy's immediate response was, no, that's not something that we've ever talked about, but it's because I don't really know how to ask the right questions or to ask for what I need. This is really significant. That would be like, imagine a third grader, their dad says, hey, you know, did did you learn how to spell a word today? And the third grader said, no, but just because I didn't ask my teacher to spell that day or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> here is a person who is going to an expert. The expert is the one who's sort of in charge of guiding the entire process. And immediately as he defaults to, but it's my fault. Not that her therapist should have introduced reparenting or anything yet. No, that's that's not what I'm saying. But Ezzy's immediate self-blame is just so interesting. She could have said, no, we haven't talked about that, period. No, my therapist hasn't brought that up. And that would have been fine. But for her, it's such an indication of self-blame is an ingrained part of her thought process, right? This is a thought pattern of hers. This happened. It's my fault. That happened. It's my fault. We're talking about this but somehow that's my fault. My fault, my fault, my fault, my bad, my bad. Just interesting. At this point, and this was my first session working with Ezzy. So at this point, I'm just kind of picking up on the way she talks and the kinds of words that she's using. And that was a big one for me. She has a strong thought pattern of my fault, my fault, no matter what. I also think it's really significant when you listen to even the tone of her voice. She's so quiet. When she sits in her chair, she takes up so little space. Her voice, you can even hear it. It kind of quivers throughout. And you add that to all of the apologies and the self-blame. It's just all an indication of she's trying to be as small as possible. Maybe it feels safe when she's small, like, okay, nobody will see me in here. If I put anything out there, it's going to get attacked. So I'm just going to keep as much of it as close to me as possible. Just be as small as possible and quiet as possible and just try to not get attacked. (laughs) So my goal, this is not necessarily her goal. This is my goal. And who cares what my goals are? We want to achieve her goals. But if I can sneak my goal in there along the way, my goal is for her to just take up more room in her seat, take up more room with her voice, take up more room with thoughts. My therapist hasn't brought up reparenting and I'm really disappointed in that. Whew, that would take up a lot of space, wouldn't it? (laughs) Instead of, man, my therapist hasn't, but that's my fault. Super important topic we need to talk about. Why are people so floored? When we put the words domestic violence to their experience, her energy shifted, her eyes widened, her neck stiffened a little bit when I brought that up, and her attention left the room. So even as the session progressed, as listeners, you can't actually see, you know when you can tell someone's thoughts are not 100% with you, someone's thinking about something else, but they're They're still looking at you. They're still having a conversation with you, but you can tell their thoughts are somewhere else. You can see it in their eyes, in the little micro expressions that they're making. And I can see that stuff. But as a listener, you can't see that she's kind of left the room a little bit. Part of her has. 
And she even brings it up later. Like, I still can't really get over the fact that you called it domestic violence. At that point, she starts to rejoin the room a little bit more. She was not fully disengaged or dissociated. I'm not saying that. But you could tell a little part of her was still chewing away at those words. This is typical with clients. When I use the words domestic violence, when I use the word abuse, you've been abused. When I use the word victim, you've been a victim. These words are very difficult to consume the very first time. Because our perpetrators use tactics like minimization or they make it our fault or, you know, they give us all the reasons why what I'm doing to you is not abuse. You're not a victim doing this because I love you. This is what families do. This is what love is. I mean, there's all sorts of mind fuckery that goes into abuse, right? So as victims, we don't identify ourselves as victims. We don't identify it as abuse. We don't identify it as violence. This is what moms do because they love us. We identify it as love, as nurturing, as they care for me. You'll hear, I know they really love me, but they just don't know how to show it. But victims will say words like that. I will never push it too hard. This was domestic violence. Say it. Say it with me now. Domestic violence. You're a victim. I will never push that too hard. Why? Because if a person isn't there yet, they might still be experiencing denial. And denial buys you time. You're not ready to accept reality as it actually is. So the defense mechanism of denial comes in. It'll settle in there for you. And it buys you time to live in not reality, whatever that is for you, then when your ego is ready to accept reality as it actually is, denial will lift and you will fully see, oh, okay, I am a victim. This was abuse. This is considered domestic violence, whatever the reality is. You can't push someone through denial faster than they're ready to go. And you don't want to. If they are in denial, it's because their strength is not there yet. You wouldn't want to push that on someone who's not strong enough yet. I will put it out there so that when they're ready, the information is already there. It's ready for them to like whoop, scoop it up and let's do this thing. Let's let's move forward in reality as it actually is. I don't know if Ezzy is in denial still. It would make sense if she still is just five months. Gosh, this is so fresh for her. Oh, there might be a little bit there where she's not fully able to say, yes, I am a victim of 25 years of domestic violence. Maybe she's not quite there yet. But if she is, what does that mean? When a person says for the first time, I am a victim of domestic violence. (sighs) For someone who's never been a victim of domestic violence, it's like, come on, girl, get to it. Who cares? Move on. Or stop complaining, you're not a victim, move on. You know, don't be a victim, whatever. But for someone who's actually been there and for them, it is their reality. It's a huge, heavy, like Flintstone rock, boom, that lands on you. That now you have this giant rock to lift off of you. Understanding that victimhood is part of your identity. Now, what am I going to do with that? I'm a victim of domestic violence. Okay. (laughs) Am I going to try to heal from that? What does it mean? How is it affecting everything? Has it affected my relationships? Does it affect myself? Is it part of my self-esteem? I mean, there's so much now. There's chapters and chapters and chapters of me now that I need to read and get to know because I'm looking at myself from a different lens. And then what does that mean about my perpetrator, my relationship with them? What am I going to do? Was it really love? Am I even lovable? What is love? What is caring? What is nurturing? What does a mother mean? Do I even want to be a mother? I mean, there's just so, there. it's this giant rock of just weight and just chipping away at that rock until you're not under a thousand pounds. It's so much work. And I think that's why a lot of people don't ever quite let themselves get to that place. They'll say things like, I'm not a victim. I choose to be strong. I love my mom. I know she loved me. We're going to make the best of our relationship and just move forward. She is who she is. Okay, let's do this thing, right? There's like this, this superficial strength. 
or there's a not talking about anything at all. Just going to go along with it. Whatever mom wants, I'll just do what mom wants. Just kind of kind of go away. I'm not going to really talk about it. I'm not going to say why I went away or anything. I'm just going to be over here and you be over there. And I'll just not pay attention to it. I'll just get real drunk. Just get real stoned. Feels better here. It's not so heavy. And that's a super effective way, isn't it? You can make that pain go away real quick. That heaviness. And none of it's right or wrong. It's just kind of understanding why it's real hard to get to that place of acceptance of, yeah, yep, I am a victim. I was abused. This is considered violence. This isn't love. Now, what am I going to do with all that? And we'll probably see in her next session where she's at with denial. And denial is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful mechanism. So when I say she might be in denial, that is in no way a derogatory or, or like a negative comment. It's just a really natural, beautiful mechanism. And whether she's able to fully accept that domestic violence word into her narrative will be an indication of where she's at in her denial mechanism. So I'm, I'm super excited to to speak with her next time and see where she's at with that and what she's done with those words, domestic violence. Tips for listeners. During this episode, I got Ezzy started on reparenting. I gave her the visualization of going to get that little girl and taking her home with her. And I gave her the homework of ask her what she wants from you and then write down her answer. This is what I want from you. And so as he's going to do that homework and come back and we'll hear from her next session, I want to explain the part of reparenting that most of my clients who are using this technique struggle with a bit. The most effective part of reparenting after you've done the visualization and you've gotten that little part of you with you and they're, they're a part of your life now, I will explain to my clients when you are going through a difficult time, you're having an emotional response, you're feeling flooded, which means like overwhelmed with emotion, you're going to parent that little part of you through that situation. This this tends to be a little confusing for people. So I want to try to explain it so that you can try it in your own life. Let's give an example. Let's say that someone tells you, I'm so mad at you because you showed up late and you said you would be here at 10 and you didn't get here till 1030 and you have an emotional flooding response. Your face goes hot. Your body starts tingling. You feel so angry. And all you want to do is like scream at this other person and defend yourself or fight for yourself, right? How do you reparent yourself through a situation like that? What you want to do is imagine that little you is feeling and saying everything that you are. Imagine that little you is saying, my face is hot. My whole body is tingling. All I want to do is just like fight. I just want to tell them like, shut up. I was picking up groceries for you and that's why I'm late. And why are you yelling at me? And I do so much for everything that you are feeling in your adult life in that situation. Imagine that little you, that little five-year-old you is saying the exact same words and feeling the exact same thing. As your adult self, be with that little part of you that's saying, I'm so angry. My face is hot. I just want to defend myself. I just want to tell them this, 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 this. Be with them the way that someone should have been with you when you were five years old. I see you. I hear you. And you're good just the way you are. How do you do that for a five-year-old? You sit with them. Let them say what they want to say. Let them feel what they want to feel. Maybe hold them. Look at them in the eyes. Nod yes to them. Yes, I get it. And then what would you tell a five-year-old going through that? If you are a healthy parent, what would you tell a five-year-old who's angry, who just wants to defend themselves, who's heated, whose whole body is tinkling? I might say something like, let me hold you until you cool down, baby. I love you. I get angry sometimes too. It's okay. Cry. Let it out. It's hard, baby. This is difficult. It's okay. And I'm going to be with you. So you're not telling that child, stop crying. Shut up. You shouldn't be angry. You should be happy. You should go apologize. You should, you should. No, 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 no. As a healthy adult, 
You hold the baby. Give them some space. Give them some time. Just be there with them. Tell them it's normal. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here until you calm down. You're you're good. And then when the child is calmed down and you'll feel yourself calm down, then you can problem solve. Do you want to go talk to them? Do you want to tell them why you were late? Do you want to do anything or do you want to just move forward in your day? Do you want to never talk to this person again? What feels good? Let's do that. So it's like you take your entire experience and you put it into this little person and then you become the parent of this little person and you parent them through it. And when you do that, what you are doing essentially is growing up this little immature part of you that no one ever helped you grow up. So you will be maturing yourself while you mature this little child. People are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Like, what's the child saying? What, like, how do I parent them? Maybe the hardest part for people is that they weren't parented well. So they don't know how to parent that little baby. Just keep in mind when you're parenting that little part of yourself, it's all about, I see you, I hear you, and you're good. Take your time. So whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, it's fine take your time. I'm just going to be here while you're feeling it. I'm just going to hold you. I'm just going to love you through the whole thing. And after you're calmed down, then we can talk about like how you want to solve the problem. And then problem solving is always what feels good in your tummy. What feels good in your heart? What do you want to do next? If you can figure this out, I'm telling you, it is so, so powerful. It heals quick. It heals very quick. And then, like I said earlier, check out your apologizing. When you're apologizing, why are you apologizing? Is it because you believe you shouldn't take up so much space in the world? Or is it because you genuinely want to make a repair? Just check yourself. See what's going on there. Check it out. Thank you so much for listening, beautiful people. This has been Consent to Treat Podcast. If you want exclusive content like early access to episodes, going deeper episodes, or opportunities to connect with me one-on-one, then subscribe to me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Rachel Seavers. You can find me on Facebook at rachel.m.seavers. Instagram and TikTok at Rachel Seavers MS. Rate, review, subscribe. This is really helpful for Consent to Treat and helps us to grow. And I'm excited to announce that in the fall, you can pre-order the workbook that I've written called Talk to Me, a 12-month guide for a lifetime of change. If you want more information or to work with me one-on-one, visit rachelsevers.com. This has been Consent to Treat Podcast with Rachel Seavers. This episode was produced and edited by Ellie, the editor. Thank you so much for listening, beautiful people.